everyone. Welcome back to the Minute Women podcast. My name is Grace. And I'm Linnea. How are you this week, Linnea? I'm just great, you know, back in Halifax, yeah. living my best life. You have to be back in your yeah. apartment. I am watching the boats go by every day. I'm jealous. I don't know if I should say that on a podcast. Like, does that tell people where I live? Are we going to have stalkers? <laughs> are we famous enough for stalkers? I don't know. I hope not. I don't know. I mean, but, uh, <laughs> I mean, seeing the boats pass by, I think, is uh, generic enough that you'll be okay. Maybe I live in Dartmouth. You don't know. Yeah, we don't know. I think what it does say, though, is that you live in a huge penthouse, like way up (laughs) at the top, and you can always see the boats going by. Way up. Linnea, yeah. Linnea's (laughs) I live a luxurious lifestyle. Rich. (laughs) When when we say that we're making money off of this podcast, we mean it. We're making so (laughs) much money. (laughs) So much money. This isn't a hole. We get paid in Canadian tire money. We get <laughs> That's how much money we have. Um so let's let's jump in. What yeah. are we learning about? What do I get to learn about this week on the podcast? So this week I it was really just like, you know what? Going to draw a random one out of the hat. I love see it. what we get. We're going to do uh Jean Nicolet. Do you remember the Jean Nicolet Heritage Minute? Uh, I did give me some context. Give me some, what happens in this heritage minute. So Jean Nicolet, describe it to me. He's a French explorer. This is probably the earliest one we've done. So it's like 1600s. Um, okay. And it's essentially his journey west to find the the China Sea. Oh yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. <laughs> I think this is a very early one, and I think it was because he thinks he makes it to China. Yeah, like he's like, I'm going to find China, and they like go over and the crest of this hill. Like, and they're like, yeah. look, the Pacific Ocean, but it's just <laughs> and Lake Ontario like, or Lake Michigan. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lake. <laughs> yeah, that's a lake. But it, it's funny because watching it recently. So, like, a big part of the story of Jean Nicolet is that he wears a Chinese robe. So, he has this, like, yes. this yeah, Chinese cloak. Yeah, I do cloak. remember this one. And so, he's, like, going to China. He's going to bring Chinese clothes. <laughs> and so, in the Heritage <laughs> Minute, I think this came out before Titanic. Because it ah. starts where he's, like, Monsieur, I am going to find China. And I am going to wear this. But... <laughs> While I'm watching it, all I can think is like this and only this. <laughs> but I think this came up before Titanic, so I think it was ruined by Titanic. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah. That is such an iconic line. Uh, I think it's so. I think just, <laughs> just the necklace. <laughs> I've never seen Titanic. Uh, what? I know, okay? What? I know. I've already been no. shredded for this in the past. Oh I don't watch my movies. Oh, God. <laughs> I know what uh, happens in it. Why would I watch it? I know but she do boots you? him off the door or piano or whatever she's laying on. She doesn't on. boot him off the door. Well, oh he's like, I'm not going to fit. So he, she just lets him go. No, that conversation actually doesn't happen. Never let go, Jack. And then she plunges him to the depths of the then Atlantic she, and you all cry. If I remember correctly uh, from the clips that I've seen, she holds Leonardo DiCaprio's head under the water. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, our friendship no is being here. tested right now. Our friendship is being tested. Why? This is a test. You Set know this about me. me. You have to wow. accept me for all my flaws. For all my red flags. <laughs> I just, okay. So we're going to fix this. Um, so long, When quarantine's though. over, that's my first goal. Mm. It's a great movie. Okay. So aside from that, so like, let's move on. What are we, are we talking about this dude or are we talking about? Yeah. So we're going to go okay. into his life um, and kind of like who he was. Because uh, the main thing that you get from this episode is that, we don't know a lot about Jean Nicolet as a person. Interesting. There's very little information about him. So why is did he did my best? Why do I care? Why should you care? Uh, yeah. And uh, we'll get into that. I think it's an interesting one. I think by the end of it, maybe you'll agree this is a bit of a different format than some of the other ones. But oh, you know what? Let's let's just let's just get in this boat. See where it takes us. <laughs> maybe we'll go to China. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll <laughs> maybe just we wind won't. up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> I'm ready. 
So Jean Nicolet de Belborn was born, we believe, in 1598, but we're not sure. Ooh. We know very little about his childhood and his young adulthood. We believe he was born near modern day Normandy because his father, Thomas Nicolet, was the postal courier, so the mailman, between uh, Cherbourg and Paris. So Cherbourg is roughly where Normandy is today. Uh, his mother was named Marie. And that's mm-hmm. basically all we know about his early <laughs> life. We, we know it. that he's, he, he must have been fairly well educated, just given the status of his parents. Um, yeah. But we don't really know anything about his personality, what his interests were. In a retrospective, uh, a Jesuit priest by the name of Father Vimont wrote that his disposition and his excellent memory led one to expect worthwhile things from him. Well, isn't that a nice compliment? Isn't that nice? <laughs> no one's ever said something like that about me. That's not true. So. People say that you're lovely all the time. <laughs> Thanks, we go to the same curling club, and I hear what they say about you behind closed doors. And it's always like, man, isn't Linnea the best? <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> that is a lie. That's not. No, it's not a joke. Like It's just like, oh, Linnea, I wish she was on my team. And I'm like, everyone, back off. She's my friend. <laughs> She's mine. She's mine. Oh, funny. So by 1618, Nicolet was on a ship across the Atlantic Ocean destined for the French colonies. So this is where he starts to show up a little bit more in our history books. Okay. So he was initially hired by the Compagnie de Marchand de Rouen and de Saint-Malo. So essentially, the French colonies in North America are dominated by these compagnies, and they have monopolies over different resources that are being exploited it's essentially the french government saying it's like the 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 maple syrup cartel i was just gonna say (laughs) things haven't changed (laughs) things have not changed in the The slightest are still the french the french are still the french (laughs) at least they're honest about it right now they're not saying it's for the farmers it's for the people who are part of this industry they're like no we want to make a lot of money so (laughs) no one else is allowed to be here. It's just us. <laughs> it's, just, it's just us. Just our friends. <laughs> so this particular company had a monopoly from 1613 to 1620. So Nicolet is initially hired by them in 1618. Uh, once their monopoly was lost due to a breach of terms in their contract, the rights were handed over to a different company, but this doesn't seem to have impacted Nicolet's time in New France. So he probably, his contract was just transferred over to the new company okay um he's got no loyalties no loyalties to the company (laughs) yeah it's a corporate takeover he's just a cog in the machine he doesn't really care (laughs) he's not important yet (laughs) he's not important yet so like several explorers before him nicolet was intent on living with the indigenous allies of the french in order to learn their language and customs and explore the regions they inhabited so that's what he seems to be most interested in. Like, okay. definitely wants to make money, but he also seems to want to live with the indigenous peoples. Like, that's what his talents uh, are. Interesting. So Nicolet, uh, he worked under Samuel de Champlain. Um, oh, okay. I know that guy. Yep. I know that guy. Important French explorer. Yeah, so Samuel de Champlain is an extremely important French colonist. Uh, he's responsible yes, he for is. the founding of Acadia, the founding of Quebec in 1608, which is now the oldest continuously settled city in North America, oh, that's I believe. cool. At least in Canada. Um, That's very cool. He had a very uh, extensive resume. He was a navigator, a cartographer, a draftsman, a soldier, an explorer, a geographer, an ethnologist, a diplomat, and a chronicler. An ethnologist? An ethnologist. I think that's kind of like an anthropologist. Like you write about different peoples and their customs. I I like literally the first thing that came to mind, and maybe it's because of this whole quarantine, but I was like esthetician, like (laughs) ethnologist. I was like... He cut ladies' hair. Like, that's nice. First, I'm going to make a map. Then I'm going to explore the West. And then, do you need your nails done, girl? Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Those acrylics are busted. <laughs> that's what I'm picturing. I love that. Like, that's that's very, like, that's very fresh of him. Yeah. I mean, the French are very, you know, like, in tune with their feminine side. Maybe. Yeah, I love it. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> 
<laughs> or are we just making assumptions again? <laughs> are we making broad uh, generalizations about different peoples? Yes, we yes. are. Welcome to the Minute Women <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Uh, so Champlain made between 21 and 29 voyages across the Atlantic in his lifetime, which is... That's wild. That's a huge chunk of your life. Like, just Well, and the also, time. like, in that time, yeah, in that time, like, ships and stuff, not like they are today. No. And that still doesn't sound fun today. <laughs> yeah, like, um, the Titanic, the, my... case in point. <laughs> Well, and this is probably, this is definitely, actually, this is definitely a wooden vessel. Oh, yeah. With sails. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously no motor or anything. Nope. This is the age of wind and sail. (laughs) That takes so freaking long. So long. And you have to be so attentive. I guess you'd get better at it over time. Well, and like, you're not actually sure of the land masses. Like, you just kind of think that it goes like this, but maybe it goes... (laughs) Maybe it like juts way out and you don't know and then you're dead. Like, yeah. And as we've talked about before, this is before sailors can calculate longitude at sea. Exactly. They can only accurately calculate latitude. So the difficulty of navigating from Quebec to France is hard for us to comprehend. (laughs) Yes. So during his explorations, Champlain had established relationships with the Algonquins in the upper reaches of the Ottawa River. And the greatest threat to the French at this time and their allies were the Haudenosaunee tribes south of them in upstate New York. So we've talked about the Haudenosaunee in we our have, Frontenac episode. We've talked episode. about those people. Yeah, they're a bunch of badasses yeah. and they do not like the they French. Are, <laughs> so. They do not at all. They, uh, they have some opinions. Yeah, and so... Champlain, as the the governor of New France during this time, is particularly concerned with strengthening allies with their Algonquin uh, relationships. Particularly, there is a ambitious tribe that is under the chief uh, Tessawat, and he his power derived largely from their strategic location on the Ottawa River. Okay. They were also a very ambitious tribe, though, so they wanted to increase their power. and They wanted to set up, like, customs and tolls along the river, and they also wanted Ooh. to seek out a monopoly as the middlemen of the fur trade. So That's fancy. Oh, yeah. They're like, like that's, we that's can play your game. Thinking. That, that is yeah. my, like, from researching these episodes, also from doing my own personal, like, thesis research, I think the most important thing I've learned is that I think as like white people we have this idea that like (laughs) indigenous people didn't have a cultural awareness of how capitalism worked and it's just so not the case they're like oh no we we understand we can play this game it's like we will we can establish ourselves as long as you don't give us smallpox and like try to murder us right which Which, yeah whoops (laughs) um whoopsie but so essentially when nicolet arrives this is what champlain's major concern is and so he's going to enlist Nicolet to spend a winter with Tessouat uh, on Amulet Island or Al- Alumet Island sorry so the year that Nicolet arrives this is what Champlain is most concerned with and so he sends Nicolet to live with Tessouat and his tribe on Alumet Island so he's going to spend okay. a winter there um, this island was a strategic spot on the Ottawa River And it was important for the sake of trade between the Algonquins and the French that these tribes and the French had good relations. So that is like, that's like a Canadian challenge. Yeah. Like, I'm going to send you in the dead of winter to the Ottawa River that will be frozen. (laughs) And it's very cold. Yeah. And you're just going to like hang out with this civilization. Yeah. That doesn't live in houses like we're we're living it like off the land. Uh, Yeah. And good luck. It's amazing. Yeah. To go from living in Normandy, (laughs) France, the minute you arrive in Quebec, which is already going to be quite different from the life that you're used to back in France. Like, all right, time for you to go live with a whole new people that you don't speak their language and you don't know their customs. The only thing you have in common is that you're Catholic. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and I and I don't know if I think about it more than other people because of um, 
because of my issues with my lungs and being immunocompromised. But I'm just like, I would have died. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, no, it's, like, <laughs> it's one of those things that I, like you sometimes have like boomers who are like, oh, these kids yeah. and their allergies and stuff. It's like, no, it's because those kids died. Like we just uh, have I, the technology yeah. and the science to make sure that those kids live past infancy now. The amount of times like, we I've like my mom and I've had this talk with my grandmother who like she does get it but it's like if we were born when you were born like we would have both been dead because my mom like had a really terrible labor and stuff like I was all sorts of messed up and then like I was really sick like as a little kid like I would not have made it through a first winter yeah and and like it, like that's why you don't hear about people having asthma who are like kind of boomer age yeah it's because <laughs> they died <laughs> yeah and <laughs> i mean we'll also we'll wind up talking about uh labor and stuff because there is a midwife heritage minute oh but there, oh there is for a huge the most chunk annoying of- girl <laughs> with the most annoying young woman <laughs> in heritage minute history it stands out for sure it's like just help me we'll get to that one eventually but uh if you haven't watched it go watch the the um heritage minute about uh midwives yeah yeah but like and i think maybe it's like maybe that one sticks with me more because i am a woman but the yeah off the top of my head i'm pretty sure the stat was for like a huge chunk of human history like it's like one in four women die in labor yeah it's like yeah. It's say it makes me understand why people join nunneries. It's like <laughs> Yeah. You're just like, "You know what? I'm not about that." I think yeah. I uh, I think I'm just going to avoid that altogether. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Anyways. Life was hard. The past is terrible. That's what this podcast is about. Do not time Everybody <laughs> that we're talking about is dead. Everyone we're talking about is dead. Don't go and time travel to the past. Don't do it. Or to 2020, for that matter. Actually, let's just go back, like, a year or two years. Yeah, or jump ahead. (laughs) So Nicolet wound up spending two whole years on Alamet Island instead of just a winter. So Oh. And he's carrying out his mission very well. So he's staying because he's doing a good job. He managed to learn the Huron and Algonquin languages while living on Alamet Island. So you're not you're not learning just one. You're learning two languages. That's good for him. Uh, he lived alongside the inhabitants and came to know their customs. So he's not going mm-hmm. there and being like, "All right, gonna build me a cabin and avoid you guys as much as possible." He's like living with them, and he good for began him. exploring the region. Yeah, he seems like he's like. A decent guy. Again, we really don't know that much about him, but based on his actions, he seems like he's going about this in the right way. Yeah. The Algonquins quickly accepted him in return, and they made him an honorary chief, which allowed him to attend their council meetings, and they even brought him to the negotiations of a peace treaty with the Haudenosaunee. So he's given... Oh, very fancy. Yeah. He's being welcomed right in there. Yeah, he's like given a, a place of honor among their their tribe, which is good. So after his two years, he returns to Quebec in 1620, but he wasn't there for very long. He was basically long there long enough to write a report about his mission, and then he was just sent off on another mission. So he's like, okay, back in New France for a minute, a hot minute, and then he's out. (laughs) How long was that report? Like, I'm just, I'm picturing it either being like very long or him being like, it was chill. They're usually pretty short. Uh, basically, <laughs> all of Nicolet's writings are lost, though. So we don't know actually how long Oh, that's was. so sad. Yeah. It's a shame about the 1620s. Uh, yep. <laughs> you lose everything. <laughs> this time, he was tasked with making contact with the Nipissing who lived in northern Ontario on the shores of the Nipissing Lake. Surprisingly enough. <laughs> um, shocking. Shocking. I think there's a connection there. Not positive, uh. though. So the Nipissing controlled trade routes that were becoming increasingly desirable during the early French colonial period as the French proved there was a large, lucrative market for inland pelts. So they're really ramping up the fur trade right now. Um, right. Initially. Okay. And So is this, but I just have a question. Is this like pre 
fur trade success or is this in the midst of that? Like, is this before the fur trade was really like huge? Like, I'm feeling like that was later. No. So there's definitely a lucrative fur trade at the moment. There isn't as much competition yet. So the British haven't set up like the Hudson's Bay Company yet or any of their versions of companies. So the French have been exploiting largely the cod fishery and timber in eastern Canada. So they Canada. still really got the monopoly on that. Yeah, they, they definitely control the vast majority of resources in Canada okay. at this point. And there are furs in eastern Canada. There's beaver pelts. But they know that there are indigenous tribes in the west who are already trapping animals that they can buy okay. the furs from. So that's the other thing. Like, there are a lot of French trappers don't actually trap themselves a lot of the furs come from indigenous peoples catching the furs then you have indigenous tribes that act as middlemen and sell them to the french who will then sell them in europe for a huge profit okay yes yes so this is the beginning of the french aren't trying to settle the west but they're making contact with peoples who live in the west to get the resources that those people have access to So the Nipissing assumed an important role in the fur trade, acting as intermediaries between the French and indigenous groups that were further west and that lived along the banks of the Hudson's Bay. However, the Haudenosaunee were conducting military campaigns that were competing with the Hurons and essentially just disrupting all of the trade that was taking place. The Haudenosaunee, like, I feel like they were smoking something. Like, they are just... (laughs) They, they're just they like are far more lot. militant than most groups yeah, that you come across. Yeah, they just, yeah. I just picture them with like war paint, just like yeah. smoking basil and. I mean, it's, it's really. Being aggressive. <laughs> it's like, it's not an accurate representation by any means, but when they talk <laughs> about like, f- like the fearsome indigenous people, so they would use the word Indians, which of course we do not use anymore in that context. Bad. But. Like, that's who they're talking about. They're talking about the Haudenosaunee, or the Iroquois, as yeah. they have been kind of misnamed for a long time. Um, right. And those are the ones that are, they'll largely have alliances with the British, so they'll almost always be up against French forces. Okay. But essentially, they're throwing a wrench in this whole fur trading, and so yeah. Nicolet is tasked with trying to consolidate French alliances. So he's going to go, and he's going to stay with the Nipissing, and he's going to stay there for nine years. Oh, my God. Yeah, and again, we don't have a lot of information about his time there. <laughs> um, how old? Do you have any idea like how old he is at this point? So we think that he's born in 1598. Oh, right, it's, right. It's 1620 now, so he okay. would be in his early 20s. He's not very right. old. So while he was living with the Nipissing, he kept notes and reports of all of his dealings, uh, but these memoirs were lost. So again, like, (laughs) what we do know about him largely comes from Jesuit priests who wrote, um, they're called Les Relations, but they would essentially be the reports that they wrote to their superiors back in France. And Nicolet is mentioned in about five pages. So that's basically all of our information about him. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know. He should have kept better hold of his notebook. (laughs) It's it's the historian's version of running on fumes. You're really just like, uh, <laughs> what can we infer from all of this information? <laughs> yeah. Um, what we do know is that Nicolet, he builds his own lodge while he's living on um, Lake Nipissing. He had a store and he largely filled his days by trading with the indigenous peoples, as well as questioning them about their culture and their customs and the area that they lived in so he could send reports back to Quebec. So okay. he's kind of a diplomat. That's like what his job yeah, is largely. He just seems like a pretty chill guy. Yeah, he's like, he, he's not known for being, I think the thing that I always think is like, they're always so violent. They're always so like invasive. And he yeah. doesn't seem to be that way. Of course, cool. maybe he was. I'm not sure. Ultimately, what he represents is not a great thing. But as right. an individual, he's not too bad. <laughs> he doesn't seem so terrible. He doesn't seem terrible. 
Um, so he had a relationship while he lived there with an Epising woman, and together they had Ooh. a daughter. Oh, scandalous! <laughs> yeah, it's an illegitimate child, but he oh, he takes gosh. her on as his own daughter, um, huh. and he names her Madeline Nicolet. Oh yeah, let's just whitewash the hell out of this kid. Let's let's just oh, yeah. give her a really white name. Let's give her a really just white name sure. and make sure that she's as French as possible. <laughs> yeah. Oh my. So while Nicolet is up in the woods, there's a lot of drama taking place in Quebec and okay. Europe generally. We are in the midst of the Thirty Years' War at this point in time. Oh, yes. We're coming near the end of it. So, I mean, the Thirty Years' War is really more of like a series of conflicts. I believe the last mm-hmm. one is called the Anglo-French War, but there's also a lot of wars called the Anglo-French War. <laughs> so yes. it may not be. <laughs> Welcome to history. Welcome to history. <laughs> we are not very inventive with names and we run out of them. Yes, quickly. World War One, World War Two. <laughs> Uh, what's next? Uh, <laughs> God, we ran out of names. So in 1629, three British ships led by David Kirk set up a blockade on the St. Lawrence River to seize any French ships coming oh my into God. the river. It's like C- Captain Kirk the first. <laughs> Who's Captain I Kirk? Love it. Oh my God. What? Who's Captain Kirk? Are you Star Trek? Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I was thinking pirates. I was like, are there cool pirates that I'm not aware uh, of? No, another <laughs> Canadian William Shatner. This is the second time we've talked about William Shatner on this book. Yeah, that I, I, I don't love that for us. Um, I don't think it's, it's not. Right I'm look. not like I'm not like proud of it. But uh, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> so this is David Kirk, Captain Kirk, if you will. Uh, Very nice. Captain Kirk, if you're nasty. <laughs> And so he's trying to capture French supply ships trying to go down the St. Lawrence River. Ooh, he's a baddie. Yeah, so he's a bad guy. He's he's not he's not cool. The blockade seized ships and made threats to Champlain and attempted a failed attack on the city of Quebec. In March of 1629, nine ships left Gravesend, England with a deserter of Champlain, Jacques Michel. So we have a traitor on board. And he's the oh one who's going to pilot them through the St. Lawrence because okay. we have no charts of the St. Lawrence yet. So you need someone with personal experience. <laughs> yep. At this time, Champlain sent a party from Quebec whose residents were on the point of starvation. So the point of the blockade is to prevent any food from getting into Quebec. And that's working really well. And all the people living in Quebec are starving. And that is so unkind. And that and is cruel. not cool, Kirk. God. Yeah, I'm not okay with that. Not okay. <laughs> so Champlain... This Minute Woman is mad. <laughs> the Minute Women podcast would like to distance themselves from David Kirk and all of his yes, doings. Please. Yep. So Champlain is sending out a party to meet unexpected relief fleet led by Emery de Cayenne. But unknown to Champlain, de Cayenne was also bringing word that peace had been reached in Europe uh, through the Treaty of Susa. So the war is over. Like, Oh, nice. Everything's done. Blah, blah, blah. Although Champlain's party met de Cayenne in the Gulf, they were captured by the English on their way upriver to Quebec. So the English are just like, uh, either they don't know the war is over or they don't care that the war is over. Like, they're just going to mm. keep attacking the French. I think it might be the latter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I've decided that David Kirk is a terrible person. <laughs> yeah, he is the worst. So Kirk, now aware of the desperate conditions in Quebec, sends his brothers Louis and Thomas to demand surrender. And Champlain has no other options but to surrender on the 19th of July, 1629. Okay. So Nicolet had earlier returned to Quebec with his daughter Madeline to ensure that she was ed- educated among the French because we're going to whitewash her and we're going to make her as course, French as possible. Because, like, God forbid she remembers any of her culture and upbringing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. So welcome to Canadian history. <laughs> yeah. So they had basically oh. just gotten to Quebec and then Quebec is captured and so Nicolet decides to flee because he's loyal to the French. He's not going to 
try and help the English in any way. And so he takes him and his daughter to Huron country and he essentially lives with the Hurons. And while he's living there, he attempts to thwart any plans that the English are trying to initiate to have the Hurons abandon or betray the French and start trading with the English. So, okay. I mean, so he's being like not quite a double agent, but like, yeah, I mean, he's just like a spy. Yeah, he's just refusing to allow the English to gain any traction. I mean, I don't think he was sent there with that purpose. He's just like, I need to make sure me and my daughter are safe. But also, while I'm there, I'm going to try to make sure the French uh, don't lose any traction with these peoples. Right. Also, I got to imagine maybe he has like some kind of personal connection to it. If you live with, he lived with yeah. Algonquin people anyways, where he was le- learning the Huron language. So he was probably For like, nine years. I don't want these people to betray us and go with the English. I want them to be with us. Like, I want to yeah. have an alliance with them. Yeah. So back in Quebec, Champlain is arguing rightfully that they took Quebec illegally because the war was already over. And he's like, what the heck? <laughs> he just like came and yeah. took it after the treaty was signed. That That's not what fair. What are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing there, bud? It's like, this isn't like, it's not like all fair in like war. It's like the war was over. You can't do it. So yeah. back in Europe, they're making negotiations. And essentially, they come to the agreement that Charles I of England is willing to give all of those lands back in exchange for Louis XIII to pay his wife's dowry. Ooh, so he's like plot twist <laughs> it's like i don't want to pay this this broad can you do it for me <laughs> and then That's i'll give funny. you all this land back and louis XIII's like great awesome love that and so sure <laughs> quebec and acadia are returned to the french huh at this point the company that has the monopoly is uh the compagnie des saint associés so the the company of a hundred associates <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and the problem for them, though, is they also lost a huge chunk of their fleet. So 90% of their initial investment was lost due to this. Because that's what happens in war. People die. You lose ships. Sink. You lose people. You lose land. It's just how it is. And then with the flick of a pen, it's all, it's all <laughs> changed. <laughs> it's all back. <laughs> so other than Nicolet living and like taking refuge with the Hurons, we don't really know about his participation in the war. Um, but once Quebec is returned to the French, he returns to Quebec as well. And okay. when he returns, he starts to set up a new life in Trois-Rivières, which is a beautiful little town in Quebec. And essentially, he asked to be set up as a clerk for the company, which was granted to him. But before he was allowed to set up as a clerk, he had like one last oh, mission, no. one last job. So he's got one more job to do for Champlain. Um, and he wants him to undertake a voyage west. And this is where we catch up with the Heritage Minute. Okay. So the Heritage Minute is at like the tail end of his exploring years in, uh, in the New World. and Trying to find China. Yeah, it was going to be his largest journey yet. He's going to try to find the Chinese Sea and a western passage to the Far East. So before he set out to find China... Nicolet was given a Chinese robe of damask, which is like a type of silk. And it was described by the Jesuits as being uh, ornately decorated with flowers and multicolored birds. And Nicolet set out in the summer of 1634, probably in mid-July. He's looking sharp. Uh, Yeah. He's ready to meet some people from China. (laughs) Yeah. He's He's like feeling good. It's like, I got to look fly. I got to look good. (laughs) So did he go by himself? No, so he does have a team of people, and he manages to recruit people along the way. So he meets up with seven Hurons who agree to guide him um, through uh, a section of, like, the River Valley, the River Network. Um, Today, it's believed that he reached Lake Michigan, and he winds up reaching modern-day Green Bay, Wisconsin. So okay. he's actually a really big figure in Wisconsin because he's As like, in, like, he's Packers, the discoverer. Like, Go Packers. Yeah, like that Green Bay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. If, is there another Green Bay? Maybe. I don't know. But There's a Green Bay on the social shore of Nova Scotia. Oh, really? That's it. There yeah. you go. Learn something new every day. But in Wisconsin, he's like 
considered the first European to ever be in their state. And so he's like a really big figure there, which I did not know. So it's like Wisconsin, known for cheese, <laughs> Brett Favre, Jean Nicolet, and not being China. <laughs> yeah, but apparently easily, easy mistake. <laughs> <laughs> easy mistake. So he sees it. He's like, wow, Lake Michigan, this thing is huge. This must be a sea. This must be the ocean. So Did he taste it? <laughs> like, what a dummy. Like... Great thing about lakes, okay? Low sodium, shark free. All right? All you got to do is just like dip a figure in there, give it a little lick. If it doesn't taste like the start of a boiled dinner, then it is not the Osh. Linnea is very much endorsing that you drink seawater, which uh, I am not. <laughs> do not do that. I'm just saying, give it a little taste. <laughs> just a little sample. Um, <laughs> just a little sip yeah you know? so he's here he's like i did it y'all i found it so he's putting on his Wrong. chinese robe he's oh, going gosh. out to meet the people and no it's believed that he brought two dueling pistols to intimidate them which what which has resulted in my favorite series of art that i have ever found in my life so it's because in Wisconsin, this is like the discovery of their state. It's the discovery of their city in, in Green Bay. So it's in like their Supreme, in, in their courthouse, in their uh, state house. Like this portrait, these huge murals of okay. Jean Nicolet dressed in a Chinese robe with two <laughs> no, pistols. <stop>. And <laughs> his hands are Shut always up. in the air like mad gangster <laughs> shit. Like and everyone around life. him is scattering. So it shows like the indigenous no, inhabitants. Pretend. Like there are at least five paintings of this dude no. rolling up with no. guns out. Like I come guns in peace. <laughs> Welcome to America. It's at least he, so he had one funny. thing right. You know, he had one thing right. He might not have been in China, but he knew how to approach Americans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how to make an entrance <laughs> like, like just boom. get those pistols out <laughs> so yeah i encourage anyone listening to this podcast just google jean nicolet painting and they're all like that and it's so i funny. promise it, it will be one of this coming week's instagram posts oh yeah we'll definitely make sure <laughs> we get one on our sure. insta <laughs> to include these portraits from the people of wisconsin <laughs> So he hadn't met Chinese people. He had met the Ho-Chunk people of uh, yeah. modern-day Wisconsin, which I also learned uh, another name. I don't know if it's a name that indigenous people had or if it's like a European name that like they, they gave to them by mistake. But they're also called the Winnebagos, which means... Shut up. Winnebago, like the RV, is kind of racist. <laughs> oh, Yeah. Well, I was like, oh, now, no, someone please correct me if I'm wrong. But I knew that Winnebago was racist, but I thought it was in reference to like the gypsy population. Oh, OK, maybe. And and maybe because like you're always come leaving from the same and traveling source. around. Yeah. So I feel like that might be true. Yeah. And it could have be like it could be that this particular people was really migratory. So Europeans met them and they were like, oh, they're oh, a bunch of Winnebagos. Yeah. yeah it could be I, the same yeah. word, but. Yeah. Either way, not great. <laughs> not great, not cool. And and so the story goes... We'll just call them RVs from it, now on. We'll call them RVs. Uh, mobile homes, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Um, apparently, they were, like, terrified of him. According to European accounts, they mistook him for a no god. Wonder. I'm sure they didn't, but whatever. <laughs> for a god. They're always like, oh, they oh, thought we were funny. gods. It's like, no, they didn't. I 100% like, no. bet they did not. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, he had not found the China Sea. He really found Lake Michigan. And he returned to Quebec in the autumn of 1635. Um, nonetheless, Nicolet is still remembered as the first man to explore this region in uh, the American Northwest. Well, good for him. Or at least that's what the Heritage Minute and much of Canadian and American history would lead you to believe for the last century. Oh, no. I hear a plot twist coming. Plot twist. More recent scholarship has almost entirely debunked this whole story. And they're like, never happened. What? Not that he took a voyage. They do believe that he sailed west and, and he found Green Bay. And the robe Bay. and the pistols, like, that's all true, right? No. 
So, oh. but that's my favorite bit. I know, and that's probably why it's a heritage minute. <laughs> but more recent scholarship believes that, like, the whole idea that he was looking for China was, like, totally false and never happened. Like, he didn't take okay. this voyage to find China. Um, okay. Some historians stick that it was, like, a secondary objective. Like, you know, if you find it, great, that's awesome. But, and the primary objective was to meet the Ho-Chunk people in order to discourage their alliance with the Dutch that were along the Hudson's River and to restore peace between the French and the Ho-Chunk as soon as possible. Which makes way more sense when you consider Nicolet's background. Like, that's what he's when been doing his whole his life. When you look at his resume, yeah, it makes a lot more sense that he was sent there to, like, facilitate as, a, yeah. as like, a mediator it, type deal. Exactly. Because that's kind of what he's been doing since he was, like, 18 and yeah. started going on these crazy <laughs> trips. Exactly. Like, he's a diplomat yeah. for indigenous peoples and the French. Of, yeah. Of course, that would be what he's doing. So the, the Ho-Chunk people are known for being quite aggressive, like the Haudenosaunee as well. There are accounts of, like, cannibalism amongst them. Oh, so, my word. So essentially all of the French allies who were trying to expand west are like, we're coming Got up eaten? against the Ho-Chunk people. Well, oh, they're not getting I eaten necessarily. Say- but they're coming up against the Ho-Chunk people, and they're like, those people are scary. Like, we don't yeah. we don't want to go west. We don't want to get more furs for you. It's too dangerous. So Nicolet yeah. was like, hey, will you allow these people to exist and coexist among you? Yeah. Um, so some historians are like, the China thing, that is just like a secondary objective. It's not the real reason that he went. However... In 2009, a theory was proposed that I find most compelling. Um, It was by anthropologist Nancy Lurie and historian Patrick Young. And they proposed... And where are they from? Are these American historians or Canadian historians? Yeah. So they're both from Wisconsin. Oh, they're American. Okay. Yeah. And Lurie is... She's like an anthropologist who has studied the indigenous peoples of Wisconsin for her whole career. And Patrick Young is a historian who studied, I think, largely just the development of New France and... Europeans okay but they proposed that like the whole China thing never even happened like totally a figment of misinterpretations of French documents okay okay so they suggest that Nicolet was sent to make meet and make peace with the Ho-Chunk explore the area and that's it and this theory is built on two principal lines of evidence. So we're going to get uh, investigative today. <laughs> Ooh, I love it. Hold on. I feel like I need to do like a costume change and put on <laughs> my like Sherlock Holmes outfit. Yeah, let's get our Sherlock Holmes hats. We'll get our magnifying I'll be your glasses. Watson. We're debunking a, a Minute Women mystery right now. So the first line of evidence is Nicolet and his relationship with Samuel de Champlain. So Nicolet does not write about his voyage west, but we do have writings from Samuel de Champlain. And Champlain had been very interested in finding a northwest passage in his early career. But by the 1630s, he's largely abandoned it. And he's over it. He's got enough stuff on the go. He's over it. He also knows by this point how big the world is. Like, I think it's another right. misconception. They're like, oh, they thought they could just sail to China. But they could mathematically figure out, like, even if we could find a passage, Nicolet's not going to find it in a canoe. Like, he right. he was sent out in, like, a canoe paddle ship. Yeah. And they know that the world is bigger than that. So if he were to reach China, he was going to need, like, a fleet. Um, yeah. It also appears from Champlain's... And the invention of the motor. <laughs> At least, at least a bigger boat. Give the yeah. man a bigger boat if he's going <laughs> to find China. But he's not sent out with that. So based on the equipment, it doesn't seem like that's his objective. Yeah. The other thing is that Champlain, based on his charts, was starting to get a pretty good idea of what North America, at least the eastern half of North America, looked like. And he, based on his descriptions, knew that the large bodies of water were lakes. Like, Champlain knows they're right. inland lakes. They're not seas or part of the ocean because okay. they're fresh water and largely due to the current. So the current is flowing See, into the river rather than out from the river, which would make it See, Sammy, ocean. Sammy, he, he tasted it. 
He gave it a little lick. He was like, that's fresh water. <laughs> I'm not going to concern myself with that. That's not how we're getting to China. Science says you use all your senses. <laughs> yes, exactly. Figure it out. And Champlain, he took a little, a little, and he's like, nope. That's, that's like, fresh. That's lake. <laughs> this is lake water, guys. <laughs> oh, there's a leech. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, right. Chills. Nightmares. Nightmare. <laughs> Nightmare fuel. So Nicolet likely, though not definitely, knew all of this information as well because he was hired by Champlain. So, it, I mean, it's not a guarantee that Nicolet had all the same access to information, but if Nicolet is sending him on this voyage, he wouldn't send him on this, like, foolhardy trip to just find China. Because he's smarter than that. Yeah. And I think also, like, Coupling that with his background, what he'd been hired to do in the past, it seems it more, makes more sense. sense. Yeah, it seems to make more sense. I'm on board. <laughs> I am. I am on board with this. Like, choo choo, let's go. I believe this. Revisionist history, all the board. Yeah. But the second reason that Lurie and Young don't think that he was going for China is is about the Chinese robe, and it's because uh-huh. they don't think that robe ever existed. Like, it's not real. Oh, see, that now broke that my heart really a little bit. My heart. <laughs> I'm still going to go look at these photos. These still pictures. look at the paintings because they're, uh. And if I ever become I'm an art collector, gonna, yeah. that's all I'm collecting. You want one. That's all I want. I'm going to post some <laughs> for sure on uh, on our social media because that's great. So, yeah, the, the reason that Larry and Young also doubt the Chinese expedition is because they don't believe that the Chinese robe ever existed. So, like I said earlier, we don't really know that much about Nicolet because all we know about him are from the Jesuit relations that were written, and yeah. they don't talk like about other him very people's, much. yeah, other people's accounts, yeah. And so, what they write about this journey is that Nicolet took it. They say when he mm-hmm. went on it, and they say what he brought with him, and they describe a, a robe made of Chinese damask, which. Uh, French-Canadian author Benjamin Seltzi in 1876 saw that and he inferred that, oh, it's it, it must be a Chinese robe or something close to a Chinese robe. So, OK, so that fact, so we had a little bit of assumption going on. Yeah. So he sees, you know, what happens when you assume grace? Bad things. Yeah. You make an ass out of you and me. <laughs> Have you never heard that? <laughs> no. Oh, my God. <laughs> what school did you go to? Is that like your version of dare? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did dare. Did you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Salty, Salty reads this document, and he, it says that he wore a great robe of Chinese damask, and he's like, oh, he has a Chinese robe. Great. Awesome. Love that. Going to write that in my book. So that fact was cited by a series of historians following him who don't read the original text. They're just like, Salty wrote that he wore a Chinese robe. Salty's a good historian. Must be true. And they throw it in their books as well. And oh, no. that just repeats for like a century of historians writing about the journey of Jean Nicolet. And the the interesting thing that... Pa- and they're all wrong. They're all wrong. And Patrick Young brings up is like some of them are questioning it and they know it's weird, but like they just can't make the leap and say that he wasn't looking for China. Like the historians right. are like so close to being like... Mm, maybe it wasn't this. That they're doesn't skeptical. seem to line up. Yeah, they're like very yeah. skeptical. But they're like, but he has this Chinese robe. So he must have been looking for China. Yeah. So this is problematic for two reasons. First, okay. just because you're going to China doesn't mean you start wearing Chinese clothes. <laughs> like, he's not really? a dad on vacation. <laughs> like, I thought when I came to visit you in Cape Breton, I'd have to wear like, I'd have to wear like traditional Cape Breton clothing, you know, I'd have to uh, yeah. put on like a doe skin and carry around. I was going to say know. a Dosco suit. You can put on your... A what? A Dosco suit. It's essentially like coveralls that the, the mines and the uh, steel plant would give you. <laughs> but Yeah, I was thinking either that or like a Canadian tuxedo, just a lot of denim. <laughs> yeah, that would work. That would fan out. Um 
You can wear a kilt if you want. Oh, classy. <laughs> if I come visit you, I'll wear one of those. What are those hats called? The the yellow hat. Oh, a sou'wester. Yeah, I'll wear a sou'wester <laughs> in oh, Lunenburg. Touched. I'm really touched. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to be culturally <laughs> sensitive. <laughs> but Europeans have been visiting China since really like the Silk Road had been established. And European diplomats who visited China didn't wear Chinese clothes. They wore European clothes. Also because like, this is just my assumption, like Chinese or uh, European people think everything they make is the best. They're like, right. why am I going to start wearing weird clothes? I'm just going to wear my own <laughs> <Yeah>. clothes. <laughs> so there's no like strategic advantage if you were looking for China to wear a Chinese robe, like it, it just doesn't make sense. And Nicolet had been working as a diplomat for a long time. And in all of his other journeys, he's not trying to dress like the Hurons or the Ho-Chunks or like other people's. Right. He just wears his own clothes because that makes sense. <laughs> that does make sense. So the second reason that this is problematic is that so Young and Lurie took a look at the original French document again, and the English translation to a great robe is probably more accurately translated as a cape, which oh dear, which is very common for French diplomats to wear during this time. So they would wear like yeah. a cape that usually hit at like the mid thigh. And just made out of some fancy fabric. That's all he was trying to say. Exactly. He got some luxurious fabric. Somebody made it into a cave. Exactly. He's happy to go on his way. Yeah. And the Chinese damask that they're describing, it's a silk that comes from China, but they had been producing it in France since the 17th century. And all right. very I'm often sold. you look at I'm it sold. and it's very ornately decorated with flowers and birds, just the way the Jesuits yeah. described. So I'm on your bandwagon. <laughs> yeah. So in reality, what he probably was wearing was a very appropriate, fashionable cape that happened to be very warm. decorative and made of a Chinese silk. Not yeah, warm a silk and rope. <laughs> protective of his shoulder area, which gets cold. Yeah. And, and it would have signified to the people like of his station and of his responsibilities as a yeah. diplomat. But Probably not like an Oriental Chinese robe. And the the thing is, Probably like, not. that is the only linkage to the idea that he was looking for China. There's like no other yeah. mention of searching for China in any documentation. So it's literally just this robe that for yeah. a century, including in this Heritage Minute, historians were like, must have been looking for China. So for all you kids out there that want to start writing books on history yeah make sure your stuff is accurate <laughs> get a good translation <laughs> yes for the love of god yeah get you spend know spend the money on a good translator <laughs> you'll thank us later it's worth it <laughs> so regardless of what nicolay was looking for uh probably wasn't china but when he returns he sets up in trois Rivière as he intended and he lives there beginning in 1635, and he works as a clerk for the company of Saint Associate. So just like, where's his kid? Uh, she's still living with him. Oh. Yeah, so I, okay. I, I'm not sure where she goes when he's on this journey, but right. she still does live with him in trois She's still there? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Madeline is around. <laughs> right. Little Maddie. Yep. So in 1637, he was granted 160 acres of woodland, and it may have been during this same time that he obtained co-ownership with his brother-in-law of a, a fief, so a, a plot of land, okay. which was probably in and around the Plains of Abraham in Quebec. Very nice. In 1637, he married. He married to a woman named Marguerite. And together they had a son and a daughter. Okay. And until his death... He's becoming a little family man. Yeah, he's he's settling down. It, he doesn't go roving anymore. He's not exploring. Yeah. He's yeah. settling down for good. I'm sure she was like 35 years younger than him. <laughs> I know. I was looking and I could not find anything. I was like, I hope she's really young. It's just assumed. <laughs> it's just assumed. We have a brand and we have to maintain it. <laughs> yeah. Nicolet stood out as a leading figure in the little town of Trois-Rivières, 
he offered a lot of noteworthy services based on his experience and his knowledge of indigenous peoples and customs, and it earned him a lot of respect in the community and with the indigenous peoples that live near Trois-Rivières. Good for him. Um, the Jesuits also spoke very warmly of him, which they do not do with a lot of explorers. Um, yeah. Because he actually likes the church and he tries to be a good Catholic, whereas most of the explorers uh, don't. <laughs> and the Jesuits yeah. are like, these explorers are terrible. But uh, Nicolet tries to do like missionary work. And so he's, he's written very of cool. very nicely by the Jesuits, which is another thing to keep in mind. The only documentation yeah. we have about Nicolet is written by these Jesuits who think he's a great guy. So yeah. there's like another also layer true. of bias that you have to be concerned about. Yeah. So Nicolet died prematurely in 1642 at Quebec. While he was temporarily replacing uh, the head clerk of the company, he was asked to go with all speed to Trois-Rivières to save a Haudenosaunee prisoner that the Hurons were preparing to torture. So he's like, oh, God, oh. this could cause a lot of problems. And potentially, oh, no, they weren't the cannibals. I was going to say, and potentially eat for dinner. But uh, no. no, I mean, the the I don't think the Hurons are. Anyways, <laughs> I don't know enough to anyways. say that. But yeah. So the boat that he was rushing back to Trois-Rivières on uh, capsized in a strong oh, gust of wind. Shoot. And despite all of his journeys, uh, he never learned how to swim. And so he drowned. Of course. In 1642. <laughs> and, uh, well, yeah, that's the life of Jean Nicolet, as far as we know. <laughs> as much as, as we know about him. As far as we know. <laughs> All we know is, I think this is the first Heritage Minute that we've done that while I was researching it, I was like, oh, none of this is true. <laughs> yeah, not very cut and dry. This is a completely wrong, probably, interpretation of what had happened. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, and I mean, like, for the time, I'm sure that was the prevailing theory on what would what had happened and what had taken place. Right. But um, I'm sure it would not be a Heritage Minute that would be made that way today. Yeah. Also, it's kind of an interesting one to pick. Like, I all of the accomplishments that are represented in that Heritage Minute have more to do with the United States than they do for Canada. Oh, and that's definitely why it was picked as a heritage. Oh, minute. You think so? It's like we can't give them everything. <laughs> the Wisconsin cheese packers were like, "We'll give you some money if you want to like <laughs> make one about our guy Jean Nicolet and his badass yeah. robe and his badass guns." Definitely, <laughs> definitely. But it's actually uh, doing this one for for me was really really fun because like this is like yeah one of my I think it's the thing that. You can you can still learn so much from. Yeah, you got to be a little investigator. I got to be a little investigator. I and it's like I think this is the reason that our podcast can actually be valuable. Like, of course, you know, we can we can talk about the life of Jacques Plante, and it's great. But there's not a lot of like controversy around it. There's not a lot of yeah. people debating what happened. But this is the one that's going to take us to the top. <laughs> this is the one that's yeah. going to really... We're going to be in the, the good graces of historians across Canada with this yeah. one, ladies and gentlemen. Look at you, just <laughs> building up your credibility. I love it. Oh, thanks. Thanks for letting me have my, like, nerdy moment and, like, talk about why critical thinking is so important. <laughs> it warms my heart. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of our podcast. Just to give everybody the reminder, if you're not already, please go follow us on our social channels. On Twitter, we're at The Minute Women. Uh, on Instagram and Facebook, we're at Minute Women Podcast. And I've been trying to post uh, lots of new fun materials, some questions and some trivia. Yeah. Uh, so please go check that out. Yeah, our Instagram especially has had a huge facelift as of late, which is so cool. It's so awesome. But also, if you want to rate, subscribe, review the podcast, download the podcast, uh, we're available on basically all the major podcast platforms. So whatever platform you listen to us on, that would be great. You can also catch all the episodes on our website, uh, minutewomenpodcast.ca. You can also check out the sources to the podcast. So like, if you wanted to check out the lecture that I listened to by Patrick Young, we'll leave a link to it on the sources page. And you can also have links to all of our social channels on there. All right. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.